Mr. Speaker. As I commence my contribution, I will in advance beg for your protection. As the hecklers for year of infrastructure, I am sure will continue will continue the heckle. Of course, which I hope will not disappoint them. But Mr. Speaker, today I want to take this opportunity before I delve into my presentation to say thank you to the many people who over the years since 1987 have entrusted me with the responsibility of serving them over the years. My friend to my right said he wasn't born then. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, they have trusted me and time and time again they have gone to the polls and elected me. The times when the task seemed quite burdensome, but at the end of the day, the deliveries were made to the people of Castries North, and I thank them for understanding, for being patient, and of course, having the confidence that they have demonstrated over the years. I also want to thank my family, close and far, friends and colleagues, particularly in this government, who have ever since joined in this administration has demonstrated a tremendous expression of confidence, support, and of course camar camaraderie in the execution of duties. But Mr. Speaker, it is, a, it is with a tremendous sense of pride and radiant dignity that I stand here today in full and unwavering support of the matter before this Honourable House, the Bill, Appropriation 2024-2025. Mr. Speaker, last Tuesday evening, 23rd April, in this Honourable House I sat, I listened, and I soaked in the transparent delivery of truth, honesty, accountability, and integrity by the member for Castries East, the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development, the Youth Economy, Justice, and National Security, as he so eloquently articulated the achievements, policies, programs, and plans of his government, the government of the people, by the people, for the people. A government for bread, freedom, and justice. A government who truly cares. Mr. Speaker, the atmosphere was tranquil. The mood was positive. The mood was positive. And the energy was vibrant. Mr. Speaker, there were no strangers to the truth to strangely walk out like Johnny Walker, <laughs> white. There were no nonsensical points of order or points of elucidation. Did one someone say hallucination once again? Let's not, let's not allow delusional behavior prevail in this house, Mr. Speaker. It has been quite good. But Mr. Speaker, from my vantage point, I continued to soak, almost drowning in the presentation of realism, humility, passion, and compassion. I was even more convinced that the Minister for Finance was pouring out his heart and soul onto the people the people of this country, the grassroots, professionals, 
children, <laughs> preschoolers, the youth. Oh, he's not Johnny Walker number two. Preschoolers, the youth, adults, pensioners, retirees, the fisher folks, the farmers, public officers, police and fire officers, senior citizens, elderly, the lower, middle, and upper class, no man bad. In fact, all the people were being showered with his heart and soul, the heart and soul of the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I was moved, as I said early on, yet motivated and energized by his factual and sincere presentation, as he honestly and sincerely unclothed and exposed the achievements of this government, the performance of the economy, and the opportunities presented to the people in an environment of tremendous possibilities. Mr. Speaker, this heart and soul demeanor and gesture on the part of the Prime Minister in this season of jazz created some flashback to Andy Goldmark and Michael Bolton who penned and composed the song Soul Provider, popularized by Roman Virgo. In that tune, Roman says, sings, talk about love, talk about trust. Talking about forever, baby, when you talking about us. I give you my word, stick to my guns. Believe me when I tell you, baby, take that we've just begun. You didn't understand, no, the full intent of my plan. Baby, I want to be sole provider, yeah. Baby, I want to be sole provider. I want to stay that way for the longest time. Baby, I want to be sole provider. Just say you let me, and darling, I will. I will, yeah. And the song goes on, Mr. Speaker, and I, it appears that most members know the song. I wish I could have added my voice to the music. <laughs> and we all would sing. I know you've been hurt. I know you've loved shy. You don't have to say it, baby. It's going to take some time. You got my heart in the palm of your hands. Swear it's going to stay there. Baby, give me half a chance. Mr. Speaker, yes. this indeed epitomizes the Prime Minister. The way he presented the budget, the way he gave all of his heart to the people of St. Lucia, the children, every preschool, the disabled, the physically challenged, public officers, retirees, you name it, yet still, in giving his heart and his soul, in giving his heart and his soul, Mr. Speaker, he demonstrated by the successes of the government, the growth of the economy, the surpluses, the fiscal position of the government, he demonstrated his ability, his ability to manage the affairs of this country. And so, Mr. Speaker, when a leader with so much love, with so much compassion, with so much responsibility, can demonstrate to the people that he can give, but he can manage, and he's responsible. Who else can we give to manage this country at this time? And so, Mr. Speaker, these words, as I said, epitomizes and characterizes the man, the Prime Minister. His love for the people of this country, his passion, his compassion, and his heart and soul qualities as leader of this country. I ask members when they leave today, go home and listen to Soul Provider by Roman Vigo. And if you are not satisfied, I think you can attend one of the events coming up next week at the opening of Jazz. Let me at this time, Mr. Speaker, as I thank the Prime Minister for the many gifts and the attention to the people, let me turn to some of the matters of policy, programming, and operations. This year, Mr. Speaker, 
is being awaited with bated breath. 2024 has been designated or dubbed by the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance as the year of infrastructure. In his contribution, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister on Tuesday quite rightly reminded parliamentarians that the term infrastructure does not only refer to roads, bridges, culverts, drains, and other infrastructure furniture, but collectively, Mr. Speaker, includes digital information, housing infrastructure itself, housing infrastructure, health infrastructure, communication infrastructure, like what my colleague on the right has, <laughs> education, <laughs> agriculture, social infrastructure, tourism, together with public utilities, water, electricity, energy, telecommunications, transportation, communication, airports and seaports and maritime affairs. The whole global gamut of things, that is infrastructure. However, Mr. Speaker, the year of infrastructure is part of a broader strategic policy objective of initiatives that will review, reshape, plot, shape and design policy, legislative, legislative and physical plans to erase the deficit in national infrastructure, thus augmenting St. Lucia's national infrastructure by the year 2030, the threshold for a new and modernized competitive world-class world society. I will say a bit more later in this presentation. As we launch the year of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, Permit me this opportunity to outline some of the structural physical initiatives to be undertaken during this year. A glimpse of the year of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, entails, and I read from official document, entails a list of all roads first reconstructed by this administration since 2021 to November 2023. And I state again, Mr. Speaker, I read a list of roads undertaken by this administration since July 2021 to November of 2023. I start first with the Union Granville Marisol de Gazon Junction. Pigeon Island Causeway Road, Groselay Cap Estate Road, Jerome Motut Drive, that's in Groselay, Monrepo Main Road, Cemetery Road, Passius Link Road, Passius School Road, and Miku Village Road. That's before my friend. Opica. Opica New Connection Road, Opica Gap Road. Opicon Plain Field Road, Opicon Plain Field to Main Road 2, Opicon Compesh Road, Bellevue VCL, Bellevue Pano Lane, is it Pano? Perino, sorry, Perino Lane, Bellevue Perino Lane 2. Bellevue Aldonza Lane, Bellevue Aldonza Lane Connection. Grace Asukaye, Grace Tierva. If you notice, Mr. Speaker, everybody's being taken care of. Marigo, that's in Castro South. Bar Saint Joseph. Bar Saint Joseph. In Ansari, Ansari Venus, Jonas Road. Then we move to Castries East, Marsha Main Road, Boboville Road, Wavin to Twelve Road, Two Rouge Road. Then we have a VJ Road, I believe. No, that's VG. <laughs> VG. VG Stretch, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> VG Stretch and Bocas Mondino Road. 
Then you have the Mack Road. These roads, Mr. Speaker, all of these roads have, were constructed after July 2021. During that period, Mr. Speaker, we also engage in slope stabilization, retaining walls and construction of culverts in Monciso, retaining walls in Marsha near streams of power. There were various in interventions, including retaining walls and riverbank stabilization projects undertaken to the north of the island and Bexon as a result of the November 6 rains in 2022. Bridges, Mr. Speaker, we reconstructed the Rivier Meter Bridge in Grosile. Repairs were undertaken on the Shock Bridge. Reconstruction of the Ancillary Bridge is in progress. Repairs to bridge rails in various communities were also undertaken. Road maintenance, Mr. Speaker. The road maintenance unit has provided relief on several roads, including presently the Cap Estate Road, which is currently being done through a public-private partnership with Cabot Resorts. Roads currently under construction and rehabilitation, Mr. Speaker. The Great Austin Hill in Denry North, Kazamba, Grosely, Bosejou in Grosely, Kaimanje, Grosely. In Labri, Macdomel is under construction, Majomel is under construction. The Millennium Highway and West Coast Road, which has given us tremendous problems, is gradually taking shape. Emerald Heights development in Grosely is currently under co construction. Caribel in Castries North. Cedar Heights Calabash, Calabash Road in Viewfort, and we are doing the Calabash Road as one of the roads in the overall development. Once Calabash is finished, then we continue the project into the other roads. And we now on, we now actively involved in the construction or reconstruction of the cul-de-sac to Odson Bypass Road, which is the road at the back of Massey, which links the East Coast and the West Coast. The priority list of roads, Mr. Speaker, to be considered for year of infrastructure includes, and these are recommendations out of the list submitted by the parliamentary representative, Ansari Canneries, Monsizo to Mondo Link Road, the four we know road to us Lavadi, the Boiden Community Road, Mango, Shimenef at Floraville in Ca Villa in Canaries, Riverside Road in Canaries, and Mondo Housing Development Road. These are the roads for Ansari Canaries. In Mikunov, Mikunov. Top of the list, Mr. Speaker, is La Pointe Road. That is La Pointe Main Road. Old Volet Road. Patience, Lombard, Mont, St. Marie Road. Ryan Road, Poilin mm -hmm. Road, Poilin Mini Road, Mini, Mini Road, Peter and Volet Maho Road. Then we have in Castries Southeast <laughs> Road in Therefore and Capital, Capital Hill. There bar, there bar Ring Road to Badini. La Croix to Odson. Old Belle Road. New Belle Development. Cooley Town Eastern North End. Cul-de-sac to Odson Bypass, Susie Cul-de-sac Road to Pentecostal Church and link Cul-de-sac to Deba. In Castry Central, Mr. Speaker, the Monitor Road at its junction with the Monitor Primary School to La Passe at its junction with the, La, La, the Chaussee Road. Calvary to Chaussee Road, Chaussee Road is 
currently being negotiated, Mr. Speaker, and we're hoping that construction will start in the coming weeks. Darling Road, Brazil Street, Monjiro Street, Point Seraphin Road, and La Passe Road. All of these are roads in the Castries central constituency that have been submitted and consideration is being given. In Sufra, Mr. Speaker, Fossajac Main Road, a very troublesome road, Mr. Speaker, and so we must give it some level of attention. Belvedere, Fossajac, Fossajac de Roche, Riverside Road next to the library. Roads in new development phase one and new development phase two, and also Bhutan. In Denry South, Mr. Speaker, there are not many roads to be done. <laughs> Hospital Road, <laughs> Hospital Road, High Street to Mont Gerald, Nursery Road in Lakai, St. Peter's Lane entrance to the court, Victoria Street, Denry Village, and Green Mountain Road, Ring Road. In Castries North, part of the upper part of Mondino Road to Agard Junction, Vidbutel, Boapatat, Active Hill, Lansud, and one road in Sunny Acres, Bullfinch Avenue, Sunny Acres. Castries East, T. Roche Bocage Road. Bocage to Mondino, which has been completed. Bacatel, which should be starting in the coming days, I believe. Negotiations have been finalized. Pave and Bishop's Gap. We are sharing roads east and north, and there are many other infrastructure that we share because of the boundaries that we share. Viewfort North, Zabo to Bellevue Road, as a May Zabo to Bellevue Road as priority number one. It remains incomplete as the minister, as the parliamentary rep indicated. Priority number one for completion alongside with Grace Road. So first we'll attack the Zabo Road, followed by the Grace Road, Mr. Speaker. Grace, <laughs> Grace Road, unaltered since colonial times, requires full rehabilitation. And that is the ministry's priority number two. Then Hanel's La Borde to Pera Road. V vital for VJ, right? Bamboo to Bellevue Road. Grace to Woodlands Road and other significant roads in the community. There's also canals, Peru, Vigé, Labode, well, I mentioned those already. Then we move to Castries South, Mr. Speaker. Although I believe there may be an, an error here. Castries South, Tiroche Bocage. Tiroche Bocage. And there's a mix up here both Bacatel and Bocage Mondino is repeated. Then we know there's also Oleon, Montego Bay, Cardi Road, Gardet 1 and Gardet 2, below the hill, and Morissette by the court. We have done Miku North, Miku South we have dealt with, We've dealt with Miku North already, La Pointe, Passions, Lomba, etc., Old yes. Valley Road. Miku South, Tiroche, Blanchard, Maho, Maho, and Tiroche, Mor Mor is it Moro? Moro. Labri, Pom, Pom OJ to St. Jude's Junction, De Bois OJ, Mont Leblanc, and La Grasse, Benegé. Benajé Laho, B1 G Laho, Choiseul, Choiseul, Grace Road, Saltibus, Park Estate Road, Deville Bridge, and Cedars Road.
Babuno, Maki Bougis, Cabiche, Foisson, and Upper Gara, Grosely, Sir Julian Arhant Highway, Deremo Mont Citon, Norbert Kareth, and Rivier Mitton to Deremo. Lafay, Lafay to Kareth, and Viewford South, I mentioned earlier on, St. Jude's Highway, Larissus, Cedar Heights, and Black Bay. Mr. Speaker, this is a list of the many roads that we have identified at the Ministry of Infrastructure to be undertaken under the year of infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, yes, I did. I did. Mr. Speaker, according to the list which has been given to us, the value of, mo of those roads are in the region of $400 million. It means, Mr. Speaker, that in the first phase, we will uh, attend to the most significant and critical roads in the various constituencies. So the priority list which has been given, Mr. Speaker, which are the roads for which we have already completed designs and costings, we will attempt to deal with those roads first, while we continue to assess the other roads and to prepare designs and costings for implementation. Mr. Speaker, the intention is to utilize established contractors on island to, for major roads, to engage small contractors in the tertiary and community roads. And in those tertiary and community roads, Mr. Speaker, we will endeavor to instruct and to design roads that present a rigid pavement or concrete road, as we call it. Those roads, Mr. Speaker, have much more durability in the communities, and it means that once you, once you construct such roads, you do not have to return. And yes, I have, I have concrete roads that I've done in my constituency since 2007 and 8, and this year, 2024, it needs no maintenance, zero maintenance. What we have to do, Mr. Speaker, as parliamentarians, is to ensure in the, your recommendation for the competitive bidding process by the ministry that you recommend contractors who have the competence, who have the experience, and who have demonstrated ability to deliver good quality roads. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we do not want to be held accountable for inferior roadworks and for the people to accuse this government of not being responsible enough. So once again, I'm appealing that in the construction of your community roads, when you recommend contractors, competent um, and tested, proven and tested contractors from your constituency who will participate in the bidding process, that you recommend individuals who have the necessary competence and ability to deliver those roads. Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping that once we can get competent contractors, once the weather gives us that chance, we will see an enormous amount of work being done, like you have seen in the last few months throughout the country, where we have done work um, all over. And so, Mr. Speaker, I would like to move on to some other areas which needs attention. I also want to state, Mr. Speaker, that when the parliamentary representative from Miku South made his presentation, Miku South made his presentation at the last debate, he hinted that there seemed to have been some mistrust on the part of the government in the management of the Department of Infrastructure. I really don't need to respond to foolishness, Mr. Speaker, because I believe the format of Parliament allows parliamentarians, Mr. Speaker, to be able to sit at the, the 
Finance Committee meeting, the Public Finance Committee meeting, to raise questions, to challenge the information that is presented by the Minister of Finance, and to get correct answers. Not to wait for the opportunity when one thinks that the world is listening and believe that he can sp score cheap points in bringing forward foolishness to the people of this country. But let me say, Mr. Speaker, that one example of what happened and what the Prime Minister has done, Mr. Speaker, is that over the years, particularly in the last year of the last administration, that government borrowed over $150 million with a commitment to commence payment immediately upon borrowing. So there was no grace period, there was no moratorium. It meant that once those projects were started under the, what is called a design finance construct arrangement, the contractor was entitled to receive his money the very moment, start receiving in, um, installments the very moment. What happened, Mr. Speaker? It left the responsibility after the 21st of July 2021, 26th of July 2021. That responsibility was left to this administration. So even when, even when the budget, for example, of 2023-24 was prepared and $109 million was allocated, in that $109 million, Mr. Mr. Speaker, were commitments to paying for work done on the DFCs, the bulk of it. So you had, for example, roads under the National Roads Rehabilitation Program, NRRP, some $29 million committed. You also had, under the Grosley and Cass Trees North Road Rehabilitation Program, $9 million. Under the slopes, uh, under the Millennium Highway, $47 million committed out of 109. So you take 47, Mr. Speaker, 29, that is already 60, 73 million, and then plus another nine, it goes to how much? $85 million. $85 million, Mr. Speaker. And to be $85 million, Mr. Speaker, committed ahead of expenditure. So when you brought in, Mr. Speaker, other commitments like the Silton and slope stabilization, Mr. Speaker, in terms of flexibility within the ministry, it meant that the total amount committed, totally committed, to projects and other initiatives was, 100, was $106 million, leaving us with $3.6 million, $3 million to manage other aspects of the department's commitment. So, Mr. Speaker, even with this, Mr. Speaker, the list that I read out demonstrates the, manage, the management of the economy by the Prime Minister and our ability to strategically attend to the issues at hand, to attend to the needs of the people while those empty barrels kept rolling down the street, making only noises but nothing else. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me quickly run into a few areas, or highlight a few areas that the Department of Infrastructure and the Department of Physical Development will undertake in this financial year. In this financial year, Mr. Speaker, the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Designation of Required Parking Area Order and Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Regulations will be amended, Mr. Speaker, to facilitate the introduction of parking meters and road parking zones in the country. And this is coming at a time when the Castries Constituency Council is introducing parking meters which serve to control for traffic control devices and are predominantly recommended for the ability to regulate traffic flow and curtail the major consumption of street space. That, Mr. Speaker, is necessary as we see the kind of indiscipline that is taking place even within our city and other areas where persons will park anywhere at a corner, round a corner, and even double park if necessary, just for their own comfort and their selfishness to others. 
the motor vehicles and road traffic speed limits regulations, Mr. Speaker. We will this year be looking at some amendments as we have seen an increase in road accident, vehicle accidents. In the last 10 years, we have seen 106 road fatalities. These are not just accidents, but fatalities. Within the last two years, Mr. Speaker, we have recorded an average of 25 road fatalities a year. That is too many for us to record. Then, Mr. Speaker, we will, as I said, promulgate the, um, the designation of parking zones and regulated parking areas so that we can ensure that there is order within our community. Mr. Speaker, the Energy and Public Utilities Division, we are continuing, Mr. Speaker, with the long-term energy vision which was approved by the National Energy Transition Strategy, the NETS, aiming to reduce dependency on imported fuels, improve energy security, reduce electricity tariffs, and increase the percentage of renewable energy penetration. What I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that while we are doing this in an endeavor to reduce the cost of electricity, I must admit that the initial investment in such an initiative is a major investment. However, the long-term benefit will be um, tremendous. There is a dire need to update the Geothermal Resource Development Bill of 2012 as we move into the next stage of exploration where we are hoping with the World Bank with a loan of 21 million US dollars that they will find a reliable resource so as to generate sufficient electricity with a partnership of private um, investors who hopefully will express interest for them to participate once that is so. The socio-economic benefits, Mr. Speaker, as I said, will bring about to consumers throughout the country lower and more stable e electricity prices, uh, increased economic competitiveness, and reduce air pollution due, due to decreased burning of fossil fuels. Mr. Speaker, this we are hoping we will be able to achieve and to present to the Parliament in the very near future, together with the Electricity Supply Act. Policy recommendations on geothermal, Mr. Speaker, to harmonize of, harmonization of regulations, secure and exclusive rights to the geothermal resource. Pre, um, permitting, and, permitting and time limits, one stop permitting, uh, competitive procurement process, duty free importation of renewable energy machinery, equipment, materials, and vehicles, tax exemption from carbon credits, ownership of resource will remain with the government of St. Lucia, and time bound rights to defend, to def define. Uh, resource concessional areas granted to developers. So while the resource will remain ours, that is the geothermal resource, will remain that of the government, will certainly define the concessional arrangements with the private sector. Also, Mr. Speaker, I want to move on quickly to the issue of to the issue of Energy efficient of the energy efficient bill, Minister, Mr. Prime, Mr. Speaker. Throughout all regions of the world, the energy sector is the lifeline to many industries, and is therefore a cross sectoral link to the social and economic development of countries. Saint Lucia is by no means exempt from this reality, Mr. Speaker. As the cost of energy and its related products increase, we must be innovative to remain competitive on the local and international markets and to ensure that equitable socio-economic pillars are maintained in the country. Thus, Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia needs to address what is central to the issue at hand, energy. Our National Energy Transition NETS 2018 recommends increased levels of indigenous renewable energy into the national grid, as well as energy efficiency gains and policies to mitigate against the vagaries of exogenous facts that disrupt our economic and social gains. In, ad in addressing the energy um, trilemma, 
our, of affordability, security, and sustainability. The government endorsed the nets of the national energy policy in 2023 to 2030. So, Mr. Speaker, what we are doing is really to continue our pursuit for renewable energy through geothermal, solar, wind, and other resources. This year, we are hoping that the, nece the necessary le draft legislation, which is in an advanced stage, will be presented to Cabinet and, onward, and for onward transmission to the Parliament of St. Lucia. The next piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker, that we are working on is the Electricity Supply Act. This one has been long in waiting, and the government is serious at this time to move on. We have got to the final stage of negotiations. All negotiations have been completed. The last bit of ne negotiations have more or less come to an end with the power company, the LUSLEC, and uh, at this stage, we are waiting for a final presentation to the Cabinet and for the fine-tuning of draft legislation which the Attorney General's Chambers have already have, um, prepared and are waiting for implementation. Mr. Speaker, I move on to the issue of uh, regional and international commitments. And these really, Mr. Speaker, are our, our aspect of our commitment to the NDCs and to indicate that we are certainly working assiduously as part of the national, St. Lucia National Determined Contributions to, have to, um, to indicate our commitment to reducing greenhouse gases in the energy sector by 7% as compared to levels of 2010. Also, Mr. Speaker, we are in the process of concessions to air conditioning units and electric vehicles. The government, as announced by the Prime Minister, continues in its commitment to providing concessions to persons importing electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and air conditioning units as part of our commitment to reducing the level of emissions in, to, in the atmosphere. Mr. Speaker, of course, the social and economic benefits, the implementation of energy efficient measures is one of the first steps in the um, reduction of electricity consumption costs, which in turn reflects on the cost of the importation of fossil fuel. Regional and international commitments, Mr. Speaker, continues um, throughout, and uh, this, Mr. Speaker, we are fully committed to. In the Department of Infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, Road Infrastructure Division, the Works and Roads Act will be revised this year, Mr. Speaker. We have conducted the necessary studies, and so that piece of legislation, which is a piece of legislation of 1957, is up for review to ensure that we are in keeping with the times. This initiative, Mr. Speaker, also forms part of infrastructure 2030, an aspect of reviewing our legislation to ensure that our legislation is very adequate for this current period. Information and, and communications technology, Mr. Mr. Speaker. An information and communication technology policy is an official statement which spells out the objectives, goals, principles, strategies intended to guide and regulate the development, operation, and application of ICT. The benefits of an ICT policy to the nation's economy will take into account other policies and also be considered as complementary to other sectors. So whereas, Mr. Speaker, the Department of Infrastructure is responsible for telecommunications, there's a certain aspect of ICT which relates to us, and we must at least play, play our part together with the Department of Sustainable Development, who has that responsibility, and the Department of the Public Service, whose responsibility within the public sector is that of ICT. Meteorological services, Mr. Speaker, as pre present, at present, there are no formal policy documents 
which guides the provision of meteorological services in the number of Anglo Anglophone CARICOM member countries, including St. Lucia. And therefore, this year, we are working on that aspect to help in strengthening and, and developing the, depart the, the, the Department of Meteorological Services in St. Lucia. In this fiscal year, we are hoping to complete it and to be able to present to Cabinet a policy and new legislation for the services in that um, department. Maritime services, Mr. Speaker, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect of the role of the Department of Infrastructure that is hardly spoken of. Maritime services is currently being more or less handled by, by SLASPA, but it's, it cannot remain there as a national responsibility because SLASPA is an operator. SLASPA cannot be operator and regulator. And so, Mr. Speaker, the government has mandated a Maritime Advisory Committee to review the establishment of a Maritime Authority to primarily focus on the maritime sector in St. Lucia. The placement of the Maritime Affairs Division within SLASPA is not sustainable given the conflicting roles of enforcer and operator respectively, as I said earlier. on. There is a need for clear delineation of roles and technical support services to fully enable the functional maritime administration focusing on safety, security, and pollution from, from ships. This committee is expected to report to Cabinet by June 2024. To chart the way forward, Mr. Speaker, the existing Shipping Act will thus be reviewed and relevant legislative changes enacted to meet this goal. 13, Mr. Speaker, Open Ship Registry. The St. Lucia, Lucia Air and Seaports Authority continues to make meaningful progress to ensure the island's international ship, ship yacht registry attains a spot on the IMO's white list, thus affording the island a more favorable outlook on its goal of an open ship registry, with yachts being a niche market. The state will now um, will now make a concerted effort to tap into this profitable venture. The government of St. Lucia is mindful of the need to have the supporting legislative, diplomatic, and human resources for a viable and respected ship registry. The necessary infrastructure must be allocated to engage in this expanding economic revenue stream and job creation opportunities. Going forward, Mr. Speaker, there will be a concerted effort with marketing with marketing th the product through collaboration with like-minded agencies such as the Tourism Authority, the Ministry of Tourism, and other relevant agencies. It is a sector, Mr. Speaker, which has tremendous opportunity for the country. Marine pollution from ships, Mr. Speaker, marine pol there will be a marine pol pollution bill which will be presented, the shipping which impacts, and that is as a consequence of shipping, which impacts over 90% of global trade undoubtedly has its marine pollution risks associated with economic activity. And Mr. Speaker, this piece of legislation is very important because oftentimes ships will ply your water, dumping marine waste. And this in, 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 uh, in, uh, in our environment, within our coastal waters, can affect our entire population. We're hoping that the draft marine pollution bill of 2020 will be brought to cabinet and onward transmission to parliament, which will deal with noxious liquid substances, harmful substances in package form, sewage, garbage, and air pollution. All of these are under the MAPOL um, protocol. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me move to Maritime Labor Convention. And in this area, it's an area that needs yet some attention because we do have, probably not as many as, say, St. Vincent has, many seamen who work on cruise ships, on cargo vessels, and oil tankers serving the region. And many times, in such instances, they're labor-related matters. But we have not, or at least 
assented to the, the, the protocols and we are, our people are left stranded, in, even in some instances, where they cannot get proper representation. And so we are putting the, 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 um, the we are putting, in putting people first, Mr. Speaker, we are also extending towards the seafarers and the important contributions made through remittances. Telecommunications, Mr. P Mr. Speaker, an important piece of legislation. We have got to the final stages of negotiations, although the NTRCs were expressing some concern with the Electronic um, Communications Bill, what we call the EC Bill, with some gray areas. But I believe following a meeting last week, we have made some progress. And in speaking to the NTRC, we will be meeting, having a joint meeting with Ectel to ensure that this new piece of legislation which should deal with the advancement that is taking place in the telecommunications industry, that those advancements are handled and covered by that piece of legislation. So next week, Mr. Speaker, we will be meeting and we will look at the Telecommunications Act. Remember, you have 10 minutes left. Thank you, sir. We'll look at the Telecommunications Act and to do the necessary changes and amendments and to facilitate it with this new piece of legislation. The Department of Physical Development, Mr. Speaker, and Urban Renewal. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, when the parliamentary representative for VF for South spoke, he spoke out of frustration with the services being provided at the land registry. The land registry, Mr. Speaker, for some time now has been hemorrhaging. We have seen the department under severe stress and so, what we have attempted, or what we are attempting to do at this time, Mr. Speaker, is to engage stakeholders and to attempt to improve the quality of service at the land registry. Too often, Mr. Speaker, when you enter the, Gov the Graham Lisi building, there are people who are on the outside who are complaining. If it's not air quality, if it is not mold, if it is not sick out, if it is not inability to provide a quality and competent service, that department needs an overhaul. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have met with the, with the, the um, Bar Association, St. Lucia Bar Association. We, have now, we are now reaching out to them and to more or less do an assessment of where we are now and to see how we can further improve on the services there. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, a recommendation, a proposal rather, has been put together for submission to the Prime Minister to allow us to open the registry up till 4.30. As it is now, as it is now, the registry closes at 1.30 with the claim that the air quality isn't good and therefore they need that time at 1.30. Mr. Speaker, we cannot in this modern age continue to provide such mediocrity. And so, we have decided that we will open the registry until 4.30. We have undertaken a pilot project which will be submitted to the Prime Minister to bring in a team of experienced individuals who have worked at the land registry to train some new individuals alongside the existing staff to clear the backlog of work which is sitting in there and to allow the registry to breathe and to be able to, to produce a much co better quality of service. This project, Mr. Speaker, should start in the next two weeks once we have the approval of the Prime Minister upon submission of the proposal. Mr. Speaker, however, we have taken certain initiatives, the vault expansion project of $115,313, which has been completed. And that project, Mr. Speaker, allows for the land registry record keeping function through the upgrade of the vault facility by reconstructing its current layout to suit both employees and customer needs. That would provide more space and would give us an opportunity to be able to provide better filing facilities and that will minimize the issue of the air quality concerns. The HVAC system, Mr. Speaker, heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, we have just invested $223,387 to improve the HVAC system and we have seen some tremendous um, 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 progress. Then, Mr. Speaker, 
There is the land registry, uh, yes, the land registry. The Ministry of Finance has now further provided an extra budgetary support in the amount of $476,282. Of this amount, $195 goes to the purchase of a static of static shelves and uh, 356000 for the purchase of parcel file folders, new parcel file folders to move away from what seem to be the disintegrated um, folders that's causing all the problems inside the registry. Um, and then, Mr. Speaker, I move to a project for which the parliamentary representative isn't there. The Library Square and Market Rehabilitation Project, a project costing $1.5 million, um, and part of it is a $1.329087 in bonds for the rehabilitation construction of the Library Square and Market. And we are hoping that this project will be completed in the coming months. Mr. Speaker, the intention of the project aims to positively impact the socio-economic needs of the library village as well as creating an inviting atmosphere linking the beach to the other village activities. The project completion date is December 2024-2025. Land acquisition, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, there is an enormous bill for land acquisition. And so the government is attempting to come up with strategies to curtail on the existing bill and to introduce new policies as to how we proceed with land acquisition. Some of the recommendations that have been proposed by the department include bonds, which again, you must have the monies to pay at the time when it matures. We are looking also at, Mr. Speaker, where we acquire lands, the possibility of land exchanges. Also, a yearly exchange for which the government would be committed to. Donation where possible, land donations can be sought rather than government undertaking compulsory acquisitions. Loans or grant funding, again, another source that government may wish to look into. Agencies who require land acquisition to undertake the cost of the land acquisition and make it a part of the project cost. Government ministers and district representatives should be more prudent when undertaking community constituency projects. Too often ministers would undertake land acquisition without following the correct procedure of a request to the Department of Physical Development. This has resulted, Mr. Speaker, in the department being inundated with claims long after projects have been completed. And that is a serious matter, Mr. Speaker. In a number of instances, you've had parliamentarians in, um, implementing what we call constituency development projects. And they go ahead without permission and implement those projects. And we've had, particularly in Chazel Saltibus, we have had a number of claims from constituents who claim that a road was built without um, permission or footpath was built and now are calling upon the government to pay. One final thing, Mr. Speaker, in the Department of Physical Development, and that is the issue of the digitization of the land registry. Mr. Speaker, that project has been languishing for many years. And so we have engaged the World Bank, who are the funders of the project, and they have agreed that we will proceed with the project. And hopefully, if that is done, Mr. Speaker, it will make the registry, one, more efficient, more equipped, and facilities that will allow them to be able to deliver the services to the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, this is very important because we sit on a, a wealth of information at the land registry, land information, information that investors need, information that developers need, Mr. Speaker, information that we, if we can digitize, in, digitize information, Mr. Speaker, that we can develop the necessary revenue for the country. Mr. Speaker, I want to speed on because I believe the time is coming near. I want to indicate 
that the Department, in collaboration with the Attorney General's Chambers, is undertaking the necessary steps to incorporate into the Physical Planning and Development Act to declare the PMA, and I move quickly, Mr. Speaker, into the PMA, based on recent um, experiences, to include into the PMA environmental protection area the necessary elements that will give the government that leverage to be able to protect and to preserve our environment. I request, Mr. Speaker, of $250,000 for undertaking demo demolition work um, by the Department of um, the Development Control Authority. Many times we have stopped notices and they're unable to do the demolition because of lack of resources. At the last minute, Mr. Speaker, again, the, the Prime Minister of Compassion was able to respond to us when we indicated to him the need for $250,000 to do such demolition in illegal um, settlements. Just a rundown, Mr. Speaker. Um, the legislative agenda, Mr. Speaker, for this year includes the Land Act, Registration Act, Crown Lands Act, Land Surveyors Act, Land Acquisition Act, Physical Plan and Development Act Review, and Architects Regist Registration Act. I want to say one thing, Mr. Speaker. The Crown Lands Act is a must. We must, we must review the Crown Lands Act as it is. It's, an, it's archaic. It's another 1947-1957 piece of legislation in which when you read, the commissioner of Crown Lands is more or less the owner of Crown Lands. When you read it, it almost seems that way. So he can do the legislation in itself. He can almost do anything, sell land to whoever he wants, take responsibility, give it away, do whatever it is. I'm not saying that happens. But the legislation, it is like a legislation for a colon who has full authority, and no one can stop him, even if you go to cabinet. The person who appoints him is gov the, gov the, gov the, qu the crown. And so, Mr. Speaker, we need to look at it, and the idea which is floating at this time is the establishment of a lands commission with, with um, what I call luminaries at, on the commission who can be responsible for the assets of our, of our state. Mr. Speaker, the review of the DCA guidelines I spoke of, development of the physical plan and regulations, development of the environmental impact assessment regulations, review and regulate the OECS building, building code. We are falling back in our building codes. Remember, you some, need to begin to wrap up now. Yes. Some other countries do have even better building codes than we have. And so we are in the process of doing some of those re reviews. Mr. Speaker, I want to close with some comments on my constituency. I know that most St. Lucians regard Castries North as just a part of the overall Castries Basin, along with Castries Central, East, South, and Southeast, and rightly so. However, over the last few decades, Castries North has evolved into much more than just a subdivision of our nation's capital. Castries North has, also, has found itself boasting a series of cultural, technical, and infrastructural features. We have the most secondary schools. Technical programs, historical sites, and archives exist. Hotels, malls, major highways, and we own an airport. Sports entertainment, housing and residential developments, and the list goes on. Mr. Speaker, this did not happen by accident but through the combined efforts of the citizenry and state, and even myself as a multi-term representative, not only have we made the strategic interventions, but we are now poised to take it to an even higher level. And when I speak of having our own, in, our own airport, Mr. Speaker, I must let you know that Castries North probably, and I'm certain, has the longest white sand beach in St. Lucia, the Shock Beach, from VG all the way to Shock in, the, in um, that region. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would like to reach out to all fellow sons and daughters of St. Lucia, but to the residents of Castries North in particular, and articulate just some of the deliberate features to come in what I call the Castries North Immediate Impact Socioeconomic Development Plan. 
And these, Mr. Speaker, as I run through quickly, on the social, the creation and enhancement of social programs designed to improve the social well-being of our constituents, which is already in existence under the CDP, but we're hoping that with a new initiative, we can bolster even more programs. Collaboration with the NRDF, which is located in Castries North, to design strategic human, social, and economic training programs for youth, particularly young men, young mothers, women, etc. Establish cultural development programs to target cultural activities on enthusiasts, on enthusiasts within the constituency to harness and cultivate raw talent of the youth in an endeavor to create and establish a Castries North, Castries North cultural identity. Explore awareness for the development and promotion of the creative talents in the constituency. Identify cultural spaces in strategic communities such as Carilee, Chase Gardens, Boapatat, and Leclerc, and Bizi. I must say, Mr. Speaker, speaking of Carilee, the Prime Minister has committed that this year we will complete the Carilee Park to its full potential. And uh, we, are now, we are now working on the final, de final completion designs and the costings. And uh, this, Mr. Speaker, will, this, Mr. Speaker, will more or less complement the joint community center of Castries North and Castries East, which is happening right on the, bo on the boundary or on the borders. So, Mr. Speaker, the enhancement of sports facilities designated to promote um, centers of excellence in each location. Leclerc, football, rugby, athletics, cricket, and basketball, and the Minister for Sports has already committed himself to the public to do the necessary works at the Leclerc playing field. We have a, we have a, a football, um, a rugby team based in Leclerc, and they're very good. Chase Gardens, multi-purpose sports activities, netball, basketball, small goal, and five-a-side. We have just reintroduced some new lighting facilities at the Chase Gardens court. We have, we have built stands, seating arrangements, and we are in contact with an overseas group that is likely to come down to put in the necessary rubberized surface on the Chase Gardens court, the St. Mary's College court, which I've been involved in, and hopefully the St. Joseph's Convent, just as pilot projects to see how that works. The suitable and um, protective surface. Uh, then we go to AGAD, AGAD Mini Sports Facilities, which is... Remember, the your, your wrap-up is as long as your presentation. And let me wrap up, Mr. And, Speaker. Um, I that's will, not fair I to will, all the members. I will wrap up. And AGAD, the multi-sports facilities, Mr. Speaker. Fencing, the lighting is there. Cedars, multi-sports activities. And to close, Mr. Speaker, I want to indicate that in, in Cedars, we are in negotiations with the sisters of um, St. Joseph, the Clooney, and what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, is the lower court at St. Joseph's Convent to acquire it for the public, for the Cedars community and its environs, and the upper section, Mr. Speaker, also we are looking to, use, to get that to, to, in the future, build um, an HRDC and multi-purpose court. And those negotiations are moving forward very swiftly. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for your tolerance. I certainly did push you the distance, but I hope you understand at this time, we want to make sure that as much as possible are fitted into the, into the, the envelope so that there's sensitization on the part of those who will share the love. I thank you.